Thanks for joining us here today on Worldview with Mike Lester. Each episode, we have a conversation with ministry leaders or other committed Christians with one simple goal in mind, to learn how to develop a biblical worldview. That way we can be faithful believers at the intersection of theology and life. I invite you to stay connected with us at jmichaellester.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. If you find today's episode helpful, please consider sharing it with your friends or even giving us a review. We believe it's important for everyone to know how to have a biblical worldview and to live life correctly where theology and life intersect. And so with that in mind, let's dive into today's topic. Well, welcome back, everyone, to another episode here of our podcast. I am honored today to be recording on location in El Salvador with a good friend of mine, missionary Adam Friedenstein. Adam, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Adam, uh, so tell us a little bit about uh, you and your family, and uh, tell us where you're at. All right, well, currently, I'll answer the question backwards. Currently, we're in uh, Cojutepeque, El Salvador, Central America. I've uh, been down here for about 12 years. I have just one wife, three kids, uh, <laughs> and uh, three boys. And at the moment, they are 13, 12, and 8 years old. And uh, basically, they've grown up here. Now, I've known you for, for a while now uh, because you were, in, you were in classes with me. So when you were a student... Did, did you picture yourself as a missionary? I can't remember. Yeah, that was my goal, to, okay. to be a missionary to Spanish-speaking people, but I didn't know where that was going to actually take me. I actually kind of assumed that was Mexico, because that's the only place they speak Spanish. Um, later on, my, my uh, perspective changed. I learned <laughs> they speak Spanish in other parts of the world, too. <laughs> was your wife a missionary major? Uh, no, she was uh, basically for music, and uh, but she was she was always wanting to do missions, and but she was okay doing that from the states she was pretty excited when it was going to work out to actually go somewhere so you uh had a heart for missions as a student but you didn't know really about central america it sounds like <laughs> so how how did uh how did god direct your paths here to Cahutapeque? yeah just a long story with a lot of circumstances some of them not even really that favorable at the time but definitely helped in the process but uh you know it could take a long time talking about it but basically somebody <laughs> from El Salvador, ended up at the church there and, and the college, and uh, he, you know, presented that to the pastor that they needed a church to go with a Christian school, and uh, a different missionary was uh, coming here, watching his video presentation and seeing literally the people's faces of Cahutepeque. I said, man, I want to go to El Salvador. And, um, and so just kind of, I was still in college and just kind of, you know, went from Spanish speaking to more directly El Salvador. And then I really wasn't planning on staying in Cojute, uh, Christian school. I didn't think was going to be my thing. It was scholastics wasn't my strength. Um, I was homeschooled. My first time in a in a kind of a formal larger school was college. That was a well, eye opener. And so I never really planned on being part of where there was a Christian school. Lord kind of worked those things out. But the missionary left, and I. Um, uh, I came almost two years after the church started, and the school was, you know, not doing very well, and uh, just tried to uh, work on the church and then bring the school in underneath of the church, and just a lot of things that really I wasn't expecting, but, you know, Lord knew all that. He, he got it all worked out. Have you been here about 12 years? Yeah, 12 okay. years. I'm trying to remember now the story. This is, I think this is my 11th trip here. And uh, this week, uh, just for those that are listening, uh, Adam uh, has a, uh, a seminary here where he trains people for ministry, and I've, I've had the privilege of coming down and teaching a few times. Uh, but it seems like, and this is just memory, and I may, may have it wrong, but it seems like you didn't even really get to finish the traditional candidate, or not candidate school, but language school route. I went, yeah, I did language school for a year in Costa Rica before coming here, and that was a scheduled time, one okay, year. Okay, okay. So we did do that. So were you ready to start preaching in Spanish after a year? I did it. Um, <laughs> I struggled with the language. Okay. I really did. So I went to school for a year. I did the entire program. In fact, our last three months there in Costa Rica, Esther and I both uh, had a private tutor to advance more, um, and we did. We, we advanced more than our other classmates, 
but we got here and they pronounce things differently. They have these words that aren't in the dictionary. I don't know why they do that. And uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was a challenge. And because we came immediately right into already preaching, I mean, there were services, there were always a, a small group of people, uh, all the problems in the school. And so immediately we're having to use the language, but it wasn't going smoothly. I wrote in my diary at four months in that I felt like they understood the outline. Uh, I was so excited. They understood the outline of my message, which was also on the screen. So, I mean, <laughs> I felt like it just, it was uh, not great. <laughs> okay. So even though you couldn't communicate as clearly as you felt like you wanted to, it still seemed like to me that almost immediately you had a love for the people. Yeah. Yeah, I'm guilty as charged. I love uh, I love a lot of people, but I mean, I had to have a huge heart for the people here in El Salvador. Yeah. And so, honestly, I think the only thing we had going for us for about the first year was that people just knew we loved them. And I'm not sure exactly how they figured that out, but just big smiles, and I mean, uh, uh, it's contagious. But people won't think we're coming to church because of good doctrine, though we had it. It was just kind of lost in translation, um, <laughs> but they, they knew, not just me, Esther as well, uh, we just we love the people here. We really do. Now, when you started on deputation, did you have children already? Joel was six weeks old when we started full-time deputation. Six weeks? Six weeks old, yeah. Wow. And we did that in the motor home. And then Esther was pregnant at the end of our deputation with Micah, our second child. So he was born in Costa Rica? He was, he was born in Costa Rica. Okay. And then uh, you say he was born... Here, right? Yes. In El Salvador? Okay. Yeah. Isai, he was born here in El Salvador. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've observed your kids this week. They they have a heart for the Lord as well. It's neat to see them serving here alongside you and your wife. Uh, what would you say has changed over the last 12 years for you uh, in your ability to lead and your ability to preach and communicate and the vision you have now for not just El Salvador, but uh, really Central America? Yeah, well, this is it's definitely a, an evolving process. Uh, <laughs> this is something that uh, things change. The first year was basically like, if we can survive, we would be superheroes. You know, uh, it was kind of the mindset. Um, and so language-wise, it's always a second language, but I'm much more comfortable. I can jump into many kinds of situations and, um, and enjoy conversing with people in Spanish. Um, you know, all these... I'm just required to uh, preach and teach and talk in Spanish all the time. But uh, so that used to feel like such a burden. And someone asked me to go preach somewhere. I was like, I can't do that. Like people, people, these people don't know me. I can't speak their language. And just going outside of that comfort zone of just these small group that I already know. Uh, so now I'm much more comfortable with that. And my heart is still Spanish speaking people. It's not just El Salvador. And so, um, as the Lord allows, um, we get to travel around a little bit. Many times I've been to Honduras, uh, several times in Nicaragua. I've been over there three times this year. Um, and uh, went to, been to Guatemala a few times. I went four times in three weeks uh, um, this year. Wow. And so, uh, just... Um, you said Colombia next year? Yeah, I plan on going on a mission trip to Colombia and just try to get out into other parts of the world with the idea that this isn't just about me. We're trying to reach other people who are going to in turn reach other people. There's a Bible verse about that. Yeah, I think there is one. But here's a, let me give you a context uh, for those listening to our conversation today. <clears throat> when Adam came and Esther came, the school had about 130, 100, yeah. yeah, something like that. Uh, but it had lacked leadership, uh, and there were problems, uh, legal problems or just financial problems or both. All of the above. Yeah, all of the above. And so Adam is coming here on the scene to, number one, plant a church, because there was a school first. It's a little backwards in what we sometimes think in America. We, we typically have a church that starts a school. This was a school that, that uh, people wanted to have a church here. So he's trying to plant a church, get comfortable preaching in a language, and put on the hat of director, administrator of a school. And uh, so my oldest daughter came with me uh, or in you know, those early years, <laughs> and it seemed like every day you were firing somebody. That's yeah. how she remembers it. You know, who was Adam going to fire today, Dad? And and so we'd laugh about that. But he was having to get rid of some people that didn't really have a heart for God, or didn't have a heart for ministry. It was just a job, and he was giving them chances and trying to lead through it. Well, now the school is going great. It's your biggest school yet? Uh, yeah, biggest school year. Yeah, uh, over three hundred, right? Yeah, three hundred twenty. And so they have a morning afternoon, morning and afternoon classes. It's amazing what God is doing in this property. I, I wish I could show you all of it. So anyway, the, the school is going well. The church, uh, Sunday morning, we probably would have had 170, 180 people here. And 
I preached here Sunday night. There had been over 100, 110, something like that. And I have a guest with me, my pastor from Michigan. He preached Wednesday night, over 100. Uh, we had people saved out uh, so winning Monday. We had people saved in services on Sunday. And uh, just God's doing a great thing. So then, so you got a church going strong now. You've got a school going strong. And then Adam starts a, uh, a, a seminary, a, a college, uh, uh, what we call it in the States. Uh, and so how long has that been going? Uh, 11 years. We're finishing our 11th year. <laughs> so that means he started in his first year of ministry. It was terrible, yeah. <laughs> so his first year of ministry, he's planting a church, he's writing a school, he's getting comfortable preaching a language. Oh, by the way, let's start a seminary. And uh, so I remember coming down those early days. I was one of the first uh, groups of people coming down teaching. And uh, there'd be you know 40 or 50 people here hungry for the Word of God, and Adam is translating and teaching and uh, administrating the school. Uh, so anyway, that first group of uh, people have now graduated. Uh, we're in another group now, uh, but from that group of early students, there are there are people that are actively serving in the church as Sunday school teachers. And then, uh, why don't you tell about Walter? Yeah, so Walter um, started working here on maintenance. He was the uh, him and at the time girlfriend. Uh, they were the first people we discipled, and then our first wedding. Mm -hmm. A lot of first with them. Uh, first man that. That I hired onto the team, there was only ladies working here. I was the only guy on campus. Wow! And I thought this isn't going to work. <laughs> uh, I just got—I don't know. I about that time probably had about twenty teachers, and uh, and I was the only guy on campus. Wow! And so he was the first man I hired on. Now we've got tons of them, but uh, uh, he's now. And then he became the assistant pastor for many years and worked for a total of nine years with us. Then he did deputation in Central America and has just planted a church over in Boaco, Nicaragua. Well, in the last two or three months, right? Yeah, the first less than three months ago, yeah. yeah. So so this brings us to another evolution, if I can use that word in a, in a, in a good sense, uh, of the ministry here. So there was getting a school ride, getting a church planted, and getting a college going. And now you have your own missions agency here that uh, you oversee, uh, that you're helping uh, missionaries go out into uh, not just Central America, but there's a good number. From of, Latin America. Yeah, yeah, from Latin America. Going out to the rest of the world. Uh, and so Walter would be one of those that are now uh, fruit of this ministry that's now planting a church. And so it's exciting. Very exciting. So this brings me to a question I want to just ask after 12 years of observation. Uh, now, you, now this is home. Uh, you know the people. You love the people. They know you. Uh, how would you describe the worldview of people here? Well... There's a lot. We sometimes think that's oh, a Catholic country, El Salvador, the Savior. Yeah, it's really not. Uh, I would. Uh, I came down prepared with all my Catholic uh, arguments. You know how we're going to deal with Catholics. One person in 12 years, and that was just recently, has wow. argued with me about a, You know, from a Catholic perspective, thinking I that did. they were right. I did not know that. One wow. person. Okay. So, that, so I wasn't really ready for what I dealt with or what I deal with, and that's really a charismatic uh, influence. So everybody here has somebody who's Catholic. This is basically your 60 and plus uh, year old ladies would be your strong Catholics here. Okay. Almost only. And they would be typically very uh, harsh at home and about their religion. And uh, it's a turnoff. Like nobody likes that. Nobody likes mean people. But that's just kind of what's ingrained with them to go with their religion. Though in the church they're not I don't know. They're not mean in the church, I assume. I don't go often. <laughs> uh, but really the charismatic uh, movement, even though many have not ever attended a charismatic church, it's very deep roots there uh, where Latinos are uh, emotional. Uh, so having emotionalism and things like that, it's... it's it appeals. It, yeah. Sure. It, it works. It, it's not biblical, but it feels good, you know. So, so and there's a lot of that. Yeah, interesting. Would you say that there's a general knowledge about the Bible? Or would very, you say there's more of a deep, very, skepticism? Or? Well, people will have things like the buses, the public buses here. Yeah. They'll be blasting out terrible music, uh, sometimes in English, with terrible words, terrible beat. And the bus will say, Bendición de Dios, you know, like a blessing of God. And, you know, so you have like... Jesus is my guide. That's my yeah. favorite one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Jesus is my guide. And, and so you have these kind of signs on this bus. So, but it's almost like you're... Um, you know your your lucky charm this is just sure. if, if I put Jesus on here somewhere a lot of people will have a Bible on their dashboard yeah um, and, and it never gets used it's just there and somehow they feel like we're gonna be okay yep and but it you really they couldn't tell you anything that's actually in the Bible and they'll repeat things that they hear from some unknown preacher that they heard one time and that's gonna guide them the rest of their life 
And you're like, can we just like go back to the Bible for a little while? So here's my observation after coming for 10 or 11 years. Um, you have a heart for discipleship. Yes. And the young people in your church have a great joy for Jesus. They enjoy serving. Like, like David, who led the music Sunday. How, how old was he? Is he 19, 20? He's 19. I'm I might tell, have just turned 20. I'm telling you, for those that are listening, this guy, he just, he just bubbles over with the joy of the Lord. But then Adam told me his background. It's not because of his background. It's not because of his home life. Uh, it's because Adam and Esther, they just invest in the lives of people to change that worldview from just emotionalism to biblical Christianity, but still having the emotion of joy as well. Where did you, where did you get that uh, desire or passion for discipleship? Well, that again was a moving target. Uh, in in high school, growing up in Ohio, um, my pastor allowed myself and my twin brother to work at the church voluntarily. Uh, <laughs> it was a privilege for us. And we mowed the grass and we changed light bulbs and we fixed anything that was broken. I think he might have broke stuff just for us to go. So every <laughs> week we would start off with a meeting with him. He gave us a list of about 2,000 things to do. And then we would work there 34 hour, 30 or 40 hours a week on our free time. This in the summer? This is all year round. All year round. We would do this... Um, uh, after our other job, we were homeschooled, and so we would uh, we would work, we would do school in the afternoons, and we would do that maybe in the evenings or on a day off, and um, and we both did it together. And then as we did that, he would often not just have meetings with us, but he'd invite us for supper, and then we never told mom that. So when we got home, we'd have supper again. Sure. Uh, and then uh, he would really he took a lot of time with us, and uh, then and he didn't call it discipleship, probably. No, and actually, we never did. Uh, curriculum, curriculum, or we never did any like Bible study in that. I was always in all the services, and so he taught me a lot about the personal involvement. But then later, uh, I started seeing discipleship, but I was actually never part of discipleship. I was going to ask until I yeah. got here. Okay, first so, time I ever discipled somebody was Walter Myra. I knew that uh, coming from Lancaster, uh, Pastor Chapel there has a strong heartbeat for discipleship, and I knew you would see it. But I, I wondered if you and Esther had had a chance. Uh, no. So your first time was here. First time was here. So you so, didn't really have a, uh, a guide or... <laughs> no, we had a book, and uh, we struggled with the vocabulary because now we're in Spanish. Sure. And so Walter had some kind of a background. He had gone to church for a while and then had uh, he got away from the Lord. And so he had some concept, but he, didn't, he was not a strong Christian at all. Myra had been saved in an evangelistic meeting as his wife, and... Um, had zero concept. She couldn't even tell you the Bible says that God loves you. Like nothing. She had grown up in a very harsh um, uh, Catholic home or homes. Uh, she got passed around to about eight different houses. People get tired wow. of her and just passed her to one. She never had anyone that's actually responsible for her. She didn't know anything about the Bible. And so that was our first people. And so as we're working through this, they're helping us learn how to say these words and Filling in the blanks, we don't really know what the next word's supposed to be, but they kind of throw it in vocabulary there, and then we're, we're teaching them the Bible, and it was it was phenomenal. And just to see how much they grew, I mean, we got to study a baptism and just a few weeks in, and Walter says, hey, so what do you think about the music I listened to? I forget, I should probably throw it away. I said, well, if you think so, you're probably right, you know, but we hadn't talked about music at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and just to see how he it was, how his life was transformed by just learning from the Bible, and I thought, wow, this is awesome. Is that what ignited the passion then? Yeah. yeah. So I just did it because I'd heard that's what you do, and uh, I was excited about it, but I had no idea how impactful it would be. And so I have several things that I do uh, each day and week as part of ministry and the different ministries that are going here. I still think discipleship is the most important thing that I do, mm. and it's also one of the hardest. There's a lot of heartache that comes with getting very close to people and watching them kind of grow towards spiritual maturity. And they, you know, they'll come through bumps and they'll have troubles and, and you, you cry with them and you, then you watch God do something because yeah. they've learned to depend straight, you know, directly to God. They don't need me. I, I can show them what the Bible says, but now it's with God. And they realize that. And that's phenomenal. And just see what God does. Uh, it's, Amazing. I love it. Tell, tell my listeners about uh, your internship program, because that's a growing out of this discipleship and down. It's absolutely. Or mentoring, I guess. It's part of this, uh, it's part of this discipleship and mentoring, and, and it's really 
after uh, the, the with most of these young people who are part of our, are now our interns, most of them were already in discipleship before, and they have to be at some point here in the internship. So this is now trying to prepare them for ministry. So basically, in Bible class, and now we have this curriculum, we know what we're teaching, so they're going to be solid on Bible by the time they graduate from our college. But then I see this gap, and you kind of look around, and you see people in churches, and they're struggling, and they don't know how to do a budget, and they don't know just practical things that you really need uh, in life. You know, something's broken, how to fix it, and how to handle money, and just very, very practical things that you just have to have in ministry. It's weak. And so I said, so how do we do that? We can have a couple more years of Bible college classes, but really we just need to practice that. And so as these, what used to be kids, became teenagers, and now our disciples, now are graduating from discipleship, I'm looking at them and they're just kind of, everyone's saying, go go get a job to where you can do something in life because, you know, people in ministry, they never eat. I mean, I'm not skinny. I don't know why they think that. Uh, and then, yeah, you know, they, there's this, this secular concept that you have to go get a degree that you'll never use for anything. You don't make any more money with this degree, but everyone has to have one. And so <laughs> the, I said, like, we need to work on that. And so let's, let's try to get them working here part time in these ministries. And if they can just rub shoulders with these other now teachers and Christians who are working in our ministries, and they can do that for two years, I think they'll be ready to pastor, or you know, in the case of the ladies, to accompany a pastor or a missionary. Now your your internship program has grown because now you have you know, like to, like this week I met somebody from uh, Honduras who's an intern here. We have two right now from Honduras. Yeah. Okay, and then you have. Uh, uh, you have a, uh, a single gal for, who was born in the States but has visited uh, 17 countries. She's also doing an internship here. So yeah. so what is the goal for the expansion to inviting even other people here? You know, I haven't really sought them out. Uh, they've kind of sought me out. Okay. And so this is uh, mutual friends and ministry, and, and they kind of want some direction or want to have further development. And so their pastor has called and said, hey, um, can they come over and work with you guys for a few weeks? And in the case of this single girl from the States, a few months. And um, sure, you know, we put them to work, but um, they they get a wide range of ministry. And it just changes by, by the week, basically. This is, so what's the schedule this week? Well, at the moment, this is what it is. But tomorrow, that'll change, you know. So uh, that helps because real ministry is kind of like that. And so we basically, for our interns, we don't Wait, how many are there? At the moment, we have, well, with the two from Honduras, we have 17. Um, they're here for six, six or eight weeks total. Um, we don't really roll out the red carpet for the interns. <laughs> we just pull out a table, at the t- a chair at our table and say, come live life with us for a while. And we have different folks in our ministries that uh, do that. And we say, come come live with us for a while. Come do what we do. And if I get a late night phone call, you do too. And we just kind of uh, bring them into our homes. And and then just instead of treating them as guests, we just kind of treat them as family for a while. And um, so far, so good. Yeah, uh, we, yeah. we love it. Honestly, Esther and I, we have a very strong desire to see these young people serve the Lord Bringing this full circle here with Walter, you know, who's now in Nicaragua. They were our closest friends here, and they're no longer here. We're having all these young people, and they're basically like adopted kids. Most of them, not all of them, most of them do not have a, uh, a strong family home. Most of them don't even live with both of their parents. They come from dysfunctional homes, and we we love these. I call them kids. They're not. I mean, they're 18, 20, 30 sure. years old. Um, <laughs> but uh, we we have invested so much in their lives, and then we know that one day it's, it's going to happen again. They're going to go out yeah, into yeah. the rest of the world. Yeah. There are mixed emotions there, but it's definitely <laughs> worth it. Sure, that's good. How would El Salvador rank as far as uh, financial annual income compared to other Central American countries? Um, it, we have a lower uh, minimum wage than Honduras, uh, higher than Nicaragua, and lower than Guatemala is basically divided. Uh, so in the cities in Guatemala, there's a kind of almost higher end, and then there's an extreme gap between the, you know the rural areas in Guatemala. 
El Salvador would be a little more balanced. And what would be the average income in uh, Cahuta Bay? Uh, so average would be similar to a minimum wage. Minimum wage is three sixty five a month full time. Um, some people would make uh, four four fifty, um, which is not a lot. With so that, a, a, a rich person is going to make a well to do family would be making less than five thousand a year. Oh yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and and that would be average, mm-hmm. and that would be. You know, you, you almost have to have someone else. Gas is the same as in the States. It is, or milk's, more. <laughs> milk's in the same as the States. Coca-Cola is the same as the States. The things you spend on are about the same. It's just you get a lot less money in to spend on that. Yeah. And so, you know, and the extron- electronics would be more expensive. Uh, so it doesn't go as far. It, it Basically, you take off a zero from uh, from what you would count in the States. Someone in the States would probably make maybe a $3,000 a month. And here would be three hundred. Gotcha. Um, so, and most of the income things, you would just take off a zero, and um, it's a it's a big difference. <laughs> so, uh, when you're raising support for your first time here, uh, do people try to view you as a uh, cash dispenser because they think you're American? Or yeah, well, there is absolutely a mindset here that America is about, is to send money to here, and. Um, America has definitely tried to make that um, the goal, and that's not what we're here for. Uh, one, that's not a lot that goes out. I tell people, uh, I'm a little more comfortable now, I tell people, I said, look, I don't get paid for being white. And I said, <laughs> just because I have a family in the States, it does not help me at all um, as far as you know having high income. So uh, comparatively speaking, uh, I would probably have a higher income than most of the people in our church. But uh, most of that's designated right to go right back into the ministry. Yeah. But there's always that mindset. Anybody who comes from the States, um, they just assume that there's just an abundance of money. And I'm like, you know, so actually I don't live in the States. I made a lot more money when I was there than I do now. So you have to kind of... Sure. They'll never understand that. No, I get it. So I don't make big purchases. Uh, somebody else would do that for me because it's about a 25% increase. Equal sacrifice, not equal um, sure. things. I'm like, well, whatever. What would you see as uh, the next five years of ministry here, next five, ten years? A lot more of the same. So we're uh, at the moment. Because you're starting to get into the stage now where you are, you've had your first leave, but you've got some that are right on the cusp of going out and yeah, doing. We do. And so uh, about three years ago, Second Timothy 2 2. Uh, really became a a key thing for me. I'm still young, but I started to realize one of my main thrusts needs to be helping to develop others. Because, you know, one day I'm probably going to die. It seems that that's consistent with the human race. Um, But the ministry shouldn't die with me. And it's huge right now as far as the responsibility that's going on. There's not, there's, there's several people, but the potential is awesome. And so I want that to just be able to continue on. And so I've backed off some of the things I do. I share preaching. I share different things like that. I've noticed that, yep. Even though I can, I don't need to sing it anymore, though I I did for years. Um, But our interns will all rotate through that. So I'm hoping that all these singles we have will figure out that, (laughs) hey, you know, we can get married, you know. Uh, I'm not doing as well on that side of things. But uh, had our our first couple get married. I mean, we're we're on track. And so hoping that, uh, that these... These uh, people who are called into ministry will be going out. I've told each of them, if you go somewhere, I'll help you get there. I will physically go with you, and I will uh, help you get settled and help you get church joined. I've done that with Walter. We helped them pick out their their house and uh, found such a great deal on a house. Four months before we got there, we went ahead and rented ahead of time. Um, that way, be ready for them. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, I took a week and went and did that, and then uh, I physically drove their stuff over there to help them with that and then I went back for soul winning and so uh, I've told that all of them I'll do that so I was talking to my wife one day I said and her name is Esther and I said um, we're going to be busy uh, we're going to be traveling a lot because we've got people now looking at different parts of the world as missionaries and I'm encouraging it God's calling you I'll help you get there um, but I'm like this is going to be exciting <laughs> What would you say uh, for the? Because uh, the vast majority of my listeners are in America. How would you want American Christians and American pastors? How could they best pray for you, help you? What would be some of the 
What, what would you ask people to pray for or help with? I always pray for more laborers. And I used to pray kind of thinking those would come from the north. I, I don't think that way anymore. Um, God has given us um, country to reach with the gospel. They need to go from here. Our mission board is for those that are in Latin America going out. So I really feel like either people are much more receptive and willing to grow here than they are in, in the U.S. So I always pray for more laborers. Laborers I, coming from the country going yeah, out. Yeah. Wherever. I mean, I don't really care. As long as they, they love the Lord, I want them to go to the rest of the world. Um, and yeah, Jesus had, had a pretty good thing going when he said, uh, lift up your eyes into the harvest. I, I honestly, I love... El Salvador, one of the things that I notice so much about El Salvador is when I go back to the States, there's so much bickering among churches. I'm like, what happened? Like, why would you argue? Like, this doesn't work. Well, here, we don't have any competition. Like, uh, we just have people that want, you know, going to hell and we want to reach them, and that's, you know, <laughs> it kind of works. Uh, so there's no politics here. It's just, you know, people need to get saved. We've got the gospel. Let's just make it happen. You know, let's, let's help them. And so um, I, I always pray for laborers. I pray for you know, people to see the opportunities. And then there's always a need for uh, finances, but it, it's amazing to think how much further finances go here than they would in the States. I sure. mean, we could build an entire building for what most building permits cost and uh, anywhere, so. anywhere across Latin America. Yeah. And so some people would be trying to work through, you know, uh, you know we need to get a million dollars to do a building expansion. I mean, with 5,000, you can basically build one, uh, something simple here to get us going in the right direction. So things like that. Uh, so maybe the churches can even partner with some of these missionaries in the future that are coming out. Yeah, I don't see any downside to that. Uh, there's a concept with missions, and there's divided people with this. Some people will only support people from the United States. But... If you, you know, they have international travel, they have that, all of that, supporting uh, what most people would call nationals, those are in the land that they're going to be working in, um, that goes a lot further. And so um, we've uh, done that quite a bit. And most of the missionaries that we support, we have missionaries we support, we're getting ready to take on more. Um, they're all, um, not all of them, most of them are nationals. And um, that makes a difference, you know, because we can we can help them right where they are. They already know the language, they got the culture, they know how to live uh, economically, um, but it apparently does require money to uh, to survive and to be able to eat. Sure. And so um, I, th there is a kind of a concept that American missionaries and Canadian missionaries should be different in that way. I kind of see them everyone the same. I mean, everybody eats, everybody needs food, and everyone needs uh, fuel in their car. So to me, there's not really a divide there and so i encourage every christian definitely every pastor but every christian to take mission trip once you do that and you get out to another part of the world as you know life changes you're just like okay so all of these needs in life most people have never heard about them yeah and that's when you start doing that then you're like okay so they don't need all of this stuff like what is their focus well basically they need the gospel and we kind of get back to what jesus was focused on our kids will sometimes uh, catch themselves or be complaining about something that uh, is a big deal for them at the moment, and they'll, they'll stop and they'll catch, and here's what they'll say. Sorry, Dad. First world problems. <laughs> exactly. And they, 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 it's their way of remembering, okay, it's not as bad as uh, it is. And You know, and most people don't even realize that unless they've actually been outside yeah, of the U.S. Yeah, yeah. And Canada, I think, would be very similar to the U.S. in that way. So. Sure. You need to get, you know, a couple of thousand miles away in life. You just kind of have a way of getting yourself in perspective. Do you have a place you'd recommend for people to go? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, El Salvador is pretty awesome. I, I like it here. <laughs> I appreciate what you've done here. I appreciate how God has used you and Esther and the boys. And, uh, you know, uh, when we talk about worldview, you know, I'm just seeing it firsthand as I visit here. The, <laughs> excuse me. The Word of God just changes lives. Yeah. <clears throat> and so I'm appreciative of that. And I think I just swallowed a Salvadorian bug. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, excuse me. The Spanish uh, bug. <laughs> so I am appreciative of the fact that the uh, the Word of God, uh, it does change people's worldviews. You know, I met uh, I met Walter 11 years ago. And to see him now as a pastor and to see him as uh, someone that is planting a church and leading people to Christ and faithfully serving the Lord and leading his family, yeah, it's a blessing. So anything else you want to say before we dismiss? Just... Uh, uh... I'm thankful to be on this uh, podcast. I'm really excited for the opportunity to just encouraging people to think about 
you know, missions, think about uh, reaching out, and this whole thing of reproducing. Uh, I think every church should be pregnant in the process of starting sure. another church. Uh, churches start churches. Yeah. That's kind of how it goes. And, uh, and we're seeing it I here. Love, I love doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't change it for anything. I appreciate what you're doing. Hey, guys, thanks for listening today. This has been another episode here of our Worldview Podcast. Hope you've been encouraged. And uh, Adam, if somebody wanted to reach out and get more information or just uh, contact you, easiest way to contact you? Yeah. Uh, all of our information is on our website, reachingelsalvador.com. Uh, my email is adam at reachingelsalvador.com. And uh, those there are good ways to get a hold of us. Yeah, so if you don't follow the ministry here, I encourage you to do it. Well worth your, your time and your investment. Uh, it's a place where God is definitely at work. Thanks again for listening. Look forward to it in our next episode. Thanks for joining us here today at Worldview with Mike Lester. I hope you've been encouraged and challenged. If you have, take a moment and share this episode with your friends on social media as well. And if you're looking for more valuable, helpful resources, feel free to look at jmichaellester.com. I'll see you in the next episode. Once again, Mike Lester here with Worldview. See you soon.